constitutional law and human rights, so topics that are really pertinent to our gathering here. Um, uh, he served as clerk for Justice White in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, he has uh, many books to his credit, uh, uh, Legitimacy, Legitimacy and History in American Constitutional Theory, um, Law and Love, and Trials of King Lear, Political Theology, uh, Four New Chapters in the Concept of Sovereignty, and many others. I'm picking those out of his uh, interests that are gathered today. Uh, today, Paul will be speaking on a constitutional culture between law and power. Thank you so much. <laughs> As a young lawyer, I was asked by the American State Department to travel to Liberia to help them draft a new constitution. After years of authoritarian governments, the Liberians had recently had a major coup. The young leaders of which were now promising to transition to democracy. I naturally wondered what was wrong with their old constitution. Uh, and I went off to Georgetown Law School Library. Uh, I was very surprised to find that the constitutional text was pretty much the same as that of the United States. Well, it was a lesson. Two nations with the same text do not have the same constitution. The problems Liberia faced arose not from the text, but from the absence of constitutional culture. Changing the text was not going to change this. The country did indeed descend into years of civil war. The mistake of the American legal missionaries was to think that the problem was to convince the leadership to accept the text. The legal text, however, neither produces nor controls power. Power there was palpably evident. No complicated questions of hegemonic forms of discourse, no subtle economic structures, no complex history of relations among political parties. Even traditionally powerful families could be displaced by the coup. There were, instead, young men with guns. It was close to Hobbes' idea of the state of nature. The brutality of the situation clarified matters for me, but it did not change the basic problem of creating and maintaining a constitutional culture. A constitution is not a gift that experts can give to a country. We Americans were simply projecting onto the Liberians our familiar fetishes of the text. We regularly translate, ah, we Americans, regularly translate our political structures into issues of textual interpretation. For example, war powers, affirmative action, abortion, educational opportunity, these are the familiar disputes uh, we have about the Constitution. Think of a battle over Trump's proposed immigration ban. Again, immediately becomes a constitutional issue. My African adventure taught me that no legal text exists apart from political practices, which in turn are ways of acting within and with respect to institutions. In the United States, the privilege of text is the privilege courts, for they have the authority to decide what the text means. Although here, too, political reality may not uh, follow judicial decisions. In Africa, we were talking about texts with no thought whatsoever as to how to create effective courts. It's now a familiar claim that the text does not control its own meaning. Between text and decision, there must be an interpretation. <clears throat> when we disagree on interpretations, we cannot resolve the problem by appealing to the text. Some of the justice of the Rather, the text is itself a source of the plurality of opinions. Legal theory often focuses on the meta issue of establishing a legitimate interpretive methodology. Those disputes, however, occur against the background of common practice 
that sets the boundaries of our interpretive debates. We can think of those boundaries as establishing a kind of idea of respect for the text. I learned in Africa that such a practice of respect is itself a substantial achievement. If the text is indeterminate over a range of meanings, how exactly can we persuade those with power to commit to a text? More precisely, how can we convince them in a way that produces a meaningful restraint on their political behavior? Which means accepting the interpretation of some institution as authoritative. We certainly should not send the postmodernists on foreign missions to do the law. But their message of indeterminacy is hardly a revelation. It's a perceivably less sophisticated. An example from Liberia illustrates the point, one I, I always teach tell my students about. It. When we were drafting the new constitution, the minimum age set for the president became critically important in the negotiations. Here you may know that you have to be 35. So they were arguing there about what was the age. Uh, and the reason for this was very straightforward. The leader of the coup, a man named Samuel Doe, was very young. If he accepted an age limit, it would signal willingness to hand over governance to those whose qualifications included more than having executed the previous administration. The age limit was accepted, but that was not the end of the story. Shortly thereafter, we learned that the young leader had a new birth certificate. <laughs> <laughs> he was now old enough to run for president. The lesson, no single provision of text controls a political outcome. There's always lots of law, which means there are always multiple sources to use in the pursuit of a political goal. No legal text sets its own agenda. Writing more or different law will not solve the problem of indeterminacy. Institutions created for one purpose can be deployed to opposite ends. Think of our own problems with regulatory capture. Looking back on my African experience, I see that I did not know what I was doing. Uh, I thought the battle was over legal text, but the real issue had nothing to do with getting the text right. It had to do with how legal text is imagined within a community. The Constitution, I learned, is not about text, but about culture. Those young men with guns operated without the legal imagination. My African adventure taught me something else important, although less evident at the time. I learned that the transition from revolution to constitution is the most difficult and the most important step in the nation's history. The revolutionary leadership of Liberia failed to make the transit. They ended up dead. We might not have, great, uh, have a lot of sympathy for them, but their country did descend into civil war and violent chaos. Revolutions demolish an existing legal order, but revolutions have a way of turning it into civil war, and civil war into chaos. This transition from revolution to constitution is exactly what has been an issue in the aftermath of the uh, spring, an issue that's come up in several panels over the last day. And in most cases, the transition those countries to scale. Establishing a constitution is not merely a matter of writing a text, but creating, of creating a culture that mediates between legal text and political power. And because power is never fully controlled by law, the transition from revolution to constitution is never really finished. It's not an event that happens, but a sort of existential condition carried forward in a set of practices and beliefs. The possibility of crisis undermining the legal order is always there. There must, therefore, be a continuing choice for law. Carl Schmitt expressed a reverse image at this point when he emphasized the decision for the exception. The possibility of that decision means, however, that law is no less of a choice. Culture is a way of speaking of this existential condition, for culture is neither a gift from outside experts nor a natural condition. It is rather a way of imagining itself and others within the community. It continues only as long as the imagination remains, and that, in some deep sense, is up to us. One way of understanding the contemporary crisis in American politics is to see it as a failure in constitutional culture. It can no longer be taken for granted that those with political power will make the choice of the law, nor that the people will continue to make that choice. Populism generally <coughs> has limitations for law. It rejects the claim that law and legal institutions are representative. It sees elite self-interest in place of American identity. 
Thus, Trump often attacks the law and its institutions. He promises deals, not rules. The lesson of Liberia should make us worry that absent that culture, we may not be so far from our own civil war. But hopefully that war will be considerably less violent. We American constitutional missionaries focused on text because we think we know how to draft the Constitution. We do not know how to create a constitutional culture. 20 years after I was sent to Africa, the Tickle administration, again filled with bright young lawyers who thought they knew what they did not, went off to draft a constitution for Iraq. The stakes were considerably higher, but the disaster is much the same. But it's not just the State Department that makes this mistake of confusing what we can know with what we need to know. Something similar is true of most scholars of comparative constitutional law. They know how to compare constitutional texts and specify structures, norms, and procedures. They can also compare cases from constitutional courts. They just have to go translate them. It's easy to ask how different courts treat, for example, uh, access to abortion. But do we really think that one can understand the meaning of Roe versus Wade by reading the text? And I'm a great fan of the reading the text. <laughs> Rather, the text serves as a sort of noble point for multiple strands of meaning involving courts, families, churches, feminism, politics, cultural wars, conscientious objection, the Holocaust, and much more. Each strand has a history that continues to bear on its meaning. Each is set in relationship with all the others. These strands do not form a single coherent whole, but offer multiple points of access to a common point. They offer the sources from which we argue when we try to persuade each other. Wanting to be experts, we privilege an object about which we can be experts, the legal text. Even courts that look like they're doing the same thing, voting on cases and writing opinions, may be imagining their roles quite differently. Does the court imagine that it is conserving a set of values or progressively moving toward their realization? Is it balancing diverse interests in the power of different interest groups? Is it speaking to litigants, citizens, officials, other judges, or a global audience? Is it being reasonable, or is it being principled? There can be a difference. In whose voice is it speaking? Does it claim authority as an expert in the world? If so, is that expertise a matter of substance or a matter of procedure? Is its claim to authority a political claim, resting on the process of its own selection, or is it a representative claim? Does it speak in the vernacular or in a technical language? Does it imagine itself managing the relationship of law to the political, uh, or does it imagine itself as acting outside of the political? All of these questions have histories, and these histories continue to bear on the process. Suppose my African interlocutors had raised these issues in trying to understand what we were asking, what, what we were asking to do, them to do. What would I, I what would I have answered? All I could have said was, do it like us. That, however, would have required that they be us. <laughs> if constitutional culture extends across an entire world of meaning, then the ambition of a comparative study not only becomes harder to accomplish, it becomes largely incoherent. Culture, cultures encompass beliefs and practices with equally exceptions to the beliefs and practices. Every legal rule comes with a doctrine of exceptions. Those exceptions are not somehow implicit in the rules. You can't derive them from the rules. Uh, but they are rather what makes sense in the world within which the rule is intended to operate. Rule and exception allow us to deal with tensions, not by resolving contradictions, but by living them. Our constitutional culture does not resolve issues, but rather offers resources that can be put to use in competing arguments and practices, held together in temporary, what I would call temporary equilibrium. Constitutional culture falls between law and power. We can compare laws and we can measure power, but we can neither compare nor measure culture, for we have no access to the object of our inquiry apart from an interpretation. The culture exists only in the social imaginary. It is the work of interpretation. The stability of a culture is a structure of realized meaning. It is not a measurable object in the world. We suffer accordingly from a version of the Heisenberg principle. There is no description of the culture that is not itself a creative fact of interpretation. Comparing two cultures is more like comparing two novels than it is like comparing two laws. Is this actually a comparison at all? 
Or is this just a way of speaking to multiple interpreters? The lesson I took away from my African adventure and the chain of reflections that began there is that useful comparative work must be grounded in an interpretation of the constitutional culture within which one finds oneself. Culture precedes theory, for constitutional theory is itself a product of cultural practices and beliefs. Absent that, culture theory would be as nonsensical as trying to read the Federalist Papers to the Liberians. So in what follows, I will imagine we've done the back now. But in what follows, I'm, I will make three different but related efforts to examine American constitutional culture. I want in this way to put theory in its place, but also to point to the sorts of inquiries and a serious examination of constitutionalism would have to pursue. First, I examine the idea of a science of law, which continues to operate in judicial opinions and to be taught in American law schools. Second, I look at the representation of law in the myths that inform our dual hierarchy of uh, Athens and Jerusalem. Science and myth identify fundamental strands of reason and faith in the American political imaginary. My third strand examines the self consciously historical character of our constitutional culture. American constitutionalism began by imagining history as a space for the realization of abstract truth. That is, uh, you articulate inalienable rights and then you apply the realization of abstract truths. This was a revolutionary ideal displaced by the emergent constitutional culture, which understands history itself as a site of ultimate realities. History is now the work of the popular sovereign, which is the absolute as it shows itself in time. So what follows is kind of triangulation looking at three strands of science, religion, and history. Together, these strands have <coughs> the character of a thick description of American constitutional culture. They don't really apply to it, they suggest the directions in which such an effort would have to move. Okay, so let's uh, turn to science. <coughs> the modern American law school dates only from the end of the 19th century, when Christopher Langdell introduced the case law method of study, uh, of study uh, at Harvard. Law belonged uh, to the modern university just to the degree that it could be studied and taught as a science. Before that, you studied law and legal in the law, in practice. Uh, uh, so to bring it into the university, it had to look like a university history. The idea of a science simultaneously shapes the object of study, the law, and the character of those, the character of those who study. Professors need a science just as much as a science needs professors. And Langdell's accomplishment was largely the study of object. To normalize a technique for the study of law within the imaginative space of late 19th century science. Langdell proposed that judicial opinions be studied as evidence of underlying rules that are themselves the truth of the law. The rules are the real object of this new science. Accordingly, the particular decision, opinion, is, a value, is not valued as a form of practice or as a unique responsible conflict of individual interests, nor is it seen as a representation of an abstract truth, again, as if we were realizing some uh, abstract uh, principle. Uh, is this the law we have as an image of the law we should have? Instead, judicial opinions are points of access to an imminent order. One must learn to see through the cases to the true principles of order. This is much like any other science. It does experiment, you see through the experiment to the underlying imminent principles of the order. So uh, Langdell famously said that the library is the a laboratory of the law school. Uh, the, the pedagogy is new, but the idea of legal science is not exactly new. In the field of constitutional law, this approach is reading the cases as evidence of an evolving system of these already informed the work of the treatise writers of the latter part of the 19th century. The truth of the Constitution was not something established by the framers, they came to be seen as revenue of science, and it was not located in abstract principles that existed in the cases, moral, uh, or religious. Rather, the object of the study of the constitutional law is the character of reason as it works itself out in the institutions of governance, especially the courts. The scholar's role then is to articulate these imminent principles of order. It is to see the law behind the law. 
Langdell and his followers thought of the cases as evidence, but none of them treated the cases in the way that a modern social scientist might. They did not collate data. They did not run regressions. Indeed, it is wrong even to think of this work as grounded in data. The study of statistics was indeed starting to appear in the university, but not in law school. It's fair now, but it wasn't then. The qualitative approach to evidence dominated over the quantitative. Langdell science looked a good deal like the contemporaneous, the contemporaneous rise of anthropology, psychoanalysis, uh, and of course, uh, evolution. All share a common framing idea. Phenomena are to be treated as evidence of an imminent order, what I would call a system. In the late 19th century, system brought order to change. This was Darwin's accomplishment, to see that order and change are not incompatible. Indeed, that change can express order might be the mantra of the era. The Protestant faith and progress remains, but it's now grounded in science rather than providence. This attitude toward systems brings with its shift of scientific attention away from individual consciousness and the virtues of action, which had characterized Protestant intellectual forms. Because an imminent order is not something of which the agent is aware. A gap emerges between what an agent thinks he is doing and what science re reveals to be the meaning of the act. You can't think of something that matters. Of course, think of the comments. Uh, accordingly, the legal scientist does not interrogate actors to see what they thought they were doing. Rather, he studies judicial opinions as evidence of the system. A few decades later, legal realists attacked Langdell and his followers for perpetrating a sort of academic fraud. Langdell's formal science of law was revealed to be studying nothing but its own imaginings. This is the idea of representation we talked about earlier. Despite this attack, modern constitutional law remains deeply Langdellian. More so, I think, than any other uh, course in the law school curriculum. Exemplary judicial opinions are studied as evidence of human principles. Opinions are studied not as products of compromises of fra uh, fractious competing parties or as practical judgments regarding complex situations. Constitutional expertise is claimed by experts in doctrine. We can locate the truth of freedom of speech or executive power behind the words of the opinions. They have a theory, right? But this is what's behind, the coherent theory of the First Amendment is behind the decisions. There remains a deep belief that the Constitution is a systemic work of reason. This belief is not the possession of academics alone, it is actually what the judges prefer to offer uh, when their opinions argue from the precedents. Their effort is to make sense, principled sense of all of these Opinions, precedents. It is what lawyers offer up as well in the briefs. Remarkably, constitutional scholars continue as members of Langdell's church long after they have dropped belief in Langdell's God. Most of these scholars think the legal realists actually won the battle with the farmers. They teach the case law method as if they were followers of Langdell, as if they teach their students, but they are firmly in the legal realist camp in their understanding of how, how, how law is made and how it can be used. So when they write it out bed, they're legal realists. <laughs> they're passive, they're legal formalists. They understand that constitutional law is a field for contestation of power. They want to know who is using legal means, to what ends. Of course, this is why we argue so much about judicial appointments. Um, they will you know, attack uh, Gorsuch uh, as a new appointment. But when he issues an opinion, they will put it within the entire corpus of the legal system and explain how it, it, it itself is a site for the order of law. This bipolar attitude is not a kind of false consciousness. I don't mean to suggest that they're hypocrites. Rather, they are using the intellectual tools at hand to respond to the problem of the relationship of law to power. Taking up law, the scholars follow Mandel. Taking up power, they follow the legal realists. It is as if they can see only one side of the problem at a time. They want to believe in the integrity of law, integrity here in the Philippine sense. Nevertheless, they know that power and interests are using the law to pursue ends that are exogenous to the constitutional order itself. Each perspective is a complete account, but each does so only by suppressing the other. The Constitution is an imminent order, an imminent system of order, the Constitution is a play of power. The problem of the relationship of law to power, of authority and freedom, is therefore excluded 
from the beginning. They had no perspective that can take in both at once. With that separation of forms, it is not possible to see the constitutional order as simultaneously given and chosen. Okay, now I'm going to talk about, uh, about science, now I'm going to talk about myth. That there is no necessary relationship between law and power has been known at least since Genesis. God wrote the first constitution, the law of Eden. It had just one tradition, Dom the Apple. <coughs> Adam and Eve freely reject the law, so much for the power of a law that comes as a gift from outside. St. Paul captures this idea of a free agent before an exogenous law when he writes that the law creates conditions of its own violation. Quote, the law was brought in so the trespass would increase. Well, every parent knows that setting forth a rule creates two possibilities. The child can either embrace the rule or violate it. Like the parent, God has the power to punish the violation, but that comes too late to give force to the law. God's constitution is already a dead letter. There's no going back to Eden. If God wrote the first constitution, then Adam and Eve staged the first revolution. The story of divine creation begins with the word, but the story of human creation begins with the act. Law as a text has no power to secure its own respect. The force of law is not a function of its author, even if its author happens to be God. There must be a choice for law. The problem with Genesis is that man keeps choosing violation. The violation of law is an affirmation of freedom. Had Adam and Eve simply obeyed, we might still be in the garden, but we would not know that we are free. Adam and Eve stage a revolution, but they never quite get around to writing a constitution. Although it's possible that their son Cain did. Cain too exercises his own freedom through transgression. He murders Abel. He too suffers exile as punishment. Now, however, we are explicitly told that he went on to found a city. The pattern is set. Freedom's origin is in the act of violation. The burden of freedom is to create a space for law. Apart from his capacity for violence, Cain brings just one thing to this task of political construction, God's mark upon his flesh. That too is a text written by God. That mark upon the flesh is a, is a synecdoche of law. It links representation to identity, and with that, text to power. The task of myth is to bring law and power into alignment. The chosen people must choose to obey. Only then can we have authority and freedom. Fear of punishment is not enough to ground us to build into this choice. Genesis and Exodus show us that the choice for law is stabilized only as the internal narrative of the history of the Jews grows. Without that history, God's command is no more effective than offering a text to a West African country. Adam and Eve knew the law, and they knew how to offer the law. The force of law, however, is a function of the biblical narrative not of, of God's command. The Jewish people must come to trust their God, and that takes time, for they must build a history together. The Jews must be slaves before they can be rescued, they must turn to idols before they can destroy them, they must violate the law before they can obey its commands. The Hebrew Bible, then, is the narrative of this mutual movement of God toward community and community toward God. Having built a common life, they can persuade each other. The movement, accordingly, is not only in one direction. Sometimes the patriarchs persuade God to change his world. The biblical text, of course, is more than an interesting historical remnant. For people of faith, it is not one myth among others. Rather, it's constituted of national identity. Studying the text, the Jew does not simply learn history. Rather, he becomes it. The reader replicates the process represented, recounted in the text, he too comes to live with his God. When he sees the narrative as his own, come to live, he too comes to live with his God when he sees the narrative as his own. Accordingly, the text does not merely represent <coughs> the Jews, but constructs them again and again. The Jews become the people of the book, in the double sense of the subjects and the readers of the text. Representation becomes identity in a kind of constitutional. 
occupying this double position of reader and participant, Jews continue to confront the choice of the law. Freely choosing the law, they become what they already are. The force of law arises from this double. This is exactly what was missing in, my, in Liberia. Looking at the law, the political community could not see their own identity. Some might have thought it was a good idea to do what the law said, but it was a good idea not to eat the apple. Good ideas are open to competition with other players and proposals. A culture of constitutionalism is not one choice among others. It is an affirmation of identity in and through its law. This hardly means that we are no longer capable of change as reform and revolution, but for law is an affirmation, not a dialogue. We find something quite similar to the Hebrew Bible myth of <coughs> in the West's earliest sustained philosophical treatment of the nature of the politics. In Plato's Republic, the interlocutors freely construct an ideal constitutional theory. That's what uh, Socrates calls a city of speech. They construct a just order, responsive to their assessment of human nature, class interests, and political security. Law appears as the product of a technical craft that is, that is responsive to the needs for which Individuals come together to live in a community. There is no excellence in the law apart from the excellence of the city, and none of the city apart from that of the individual citizens. The end of the citizen and the city is justice. Precisely because of this, philosophers should be kings. They can be the craftsmen of justice. That and not chill is the early book of the Republic. I like to think of my Liberian adventure as falling in the platonic tradition. That's because I just got a PhD in philosophy <laughs> right before I went to Liberia. I learned there what Plato already understood. Philosophy, what we can call constitutional theory, can be the ground for the drafting of law, but it cannot itself be the ground for forcing law. Thus, Plato's characters in the Republic consider how it could ever happen that their ideal constitution would be taken up by an actual city. How could it become more than a city of speech? The philosophical problem of the force of thought appears already within the terms of the ideal construction. How can we make this real? Citizens of their imagined city must believe in the authority of law. They must choose the law, for they must be willing to defend the constitutional order. That belief cannot depend upon the completion of their own philosophical inquiries. Politics is not a classroom seminar although Gene Rostow said something like that years ago. Uh, politics is not a classroom seminar, and most citizens have no interest in such a pursuit. So Plato needs to imagine a ground for faith in law, and he offers a ground for such a civil faith by naturalizing that which we, the readers, know to be only a product of the founder's craft. This is his famous noble law, which says that the members that membership in a political class, number three, is a function of the natural quality of the individual soul. We are born into our social and political position. Readers know this to be a fiction, but the imagined members of the city must take it as an expression of their identity. Why, however, would anyone believe this? Plato answers that they will believe it if it's all they ever hear. We believe many myths about the origins of the world and the polity. Is it any harder to believe in the metals of the soul than to believe that the sovereign people brought about their own political existence? Plato's myth actually relies less on a claim about the comparative worth of individual souls than it does on the pre-political morality of the family. To believe the myth, is to believe that all members of the city are born of the same divine mother, the earth mother. Beside, behind their different skills, positions, and responsibilities, all citizens must believe that they share a common origin, unless a familial bond of love. The ground of law, Plato suggests, is not knowledge, but care. Care is never abstract. One loves one's family, not the ideal. The point of the myth, then, is not simply to naturalize difference, but to ground belief in collective identity. Citizens must see in the political order a representation of their own identity. Believing this, they will change the law. Okay, that was, now I'm going to turn to history. 
then bring it up to the trust account. What are the conditions of belief under which citizens will subordinate their own interests and even their own lives to the constitutional order? Genesis told us that divine authorship is not enough. Plato told us that justice is not enough. Langdell told us it's not a problem. The law will take care of itself. The realists responded that not the law, but those with power will take care of themselves. I've argued the constitutional culture lies between law and power. And that only here can we find an answer to the question of the force of law. The polities, the polities gods dwell in this space between law and power. Strikingly, the American framers did not think the law could be stripped of its connection to the gods. Like Plato, they believed there is a technique of constitutional creation by the alienable rights and institutions to not just normal institutions. Um, these were men of the Enlightenment who thought that they had access to a new science of politics. The content of the science of politics may change over time, different rights, different structures, but the fundamental idea that a constitution is a function of reason remains. Constitutional order, as the first page of the Federalist Papers announces, must be the product of deliberation and of choice, or as I would say, of reason and will. The revolutionary force of will must be directed to a constitution that is the product of reason. Despite their belief in the new science of politics, that, that paragraph more or less, I think, summarized the framers general attitude towards constitutional construction. Uh, despite their belief in the new science of politics, the American founders still faced exactly the same problem of force of law. A successful state requires more than good law. It requires more than the founder science because a decision for law must be made at every moment. The founders, like their classical predecessors, thought that this choice requires a kind of moral excellence. Even the rather irreligious American founders concluded that they had to embed the political and the religious. <clears throat> Men had to be moral before they could be legal, and they had to be religious if they were to be moral. Kant may have thought, the famous line, that a well-wrought constitution could work among a race of devils, but the American founders did not believe that good laws alone could produce the citizens required to sustain and support the laws. No constitutional order could secure itself by claiming justice as its ground. For it's precisely the claim of justice that motivates revolution. The Constitution has to be more than a good idea. The American founders shared with Plato the belief that the stability of law depends on attaching law to the prevailing sources of morality. Thus, in 1798, John Adams wrote, this is the quote, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords in our Constitution as a widow goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral or religious people. Washington had offered the same warning in his uh, presidential farewell address delivered just two years earlier. This is, uh, this is Washington. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, Religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of duties of men and citizens. The mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and cherish them. Now let us, with caution, indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Washington makes clear that the, endur the, the endurance of the economy, reason does not disavow religion, but recognizes the need of, for religion as a supplement to the theory. To tether power to law, there must be religious faith. To advance the story just a few decades, however, and we find quite a different approach to the problem of the force of law. In his famous Lyceum Address of 1838, Lincoln writes, of a problem arising from the passing of the revolutionary generation. In 38, the last of the veterans of the revolution are dying. These veterans bore scars that were the visible ground of a memory of the revolution. They were marked like Cain. The veterans constitute what Lincoln called, quote, a living history found in every family, a history bearing the indubitable testimonies 
of its own authenticity from the, limb, from the limbs mangled and the scars of wounds received in the midst of the very scenes we Their wounds literally inscribed the presence of the popular sovereign on the bodies of the citizens. Linking the scarred body of the veteran to the constitutional text, Lincoln gives voice to a new American political theology. In a sort of political rapture, Lincoln pleads, quote, let reverence for the laws be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in schools, in seminaries, in the colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books, you know, in almanacs. Let it be preached from a pulpit, proclaimed in legislative halls, and enforced in courts of justice. That's reverence for the law. Lincoln no longer sees a need to appeal to morality outside of law. That is true. Just the opposite. Reverence for law is to fill the normative space of the community, including the church. Remember, it's in the pulpit we're supposed to hear this. Moreover, reverence for law is no longer no longer refers to a natural or divine law. Lincoln's civil religion locates the absolute squarely within the history of the nation. The force of law comes not from an imminent order and not from individual interest, but from a memory of revolution. For at that moment, the popular sovereign was directly present. Lincoln sees that the authority of the Constitution need not be grounded in those virtues of character that are cultivated, cultivated by belief in either the gods who formed us or the gods who will judge us. In what then is it grounded? Lincoln's not quite sure, or at least he does not have, doesn't quite have the words to express his intuition. When pressed, he can offer only the language of reason. Law, he says, embodies the intelligence of the community. But his emphasis is on reverence, not reason. His idea of reverence is precisely not that of Adams or Washington. Lincoln shifts the object of reverence from God to the Constitution. Reverence for law is to surround the citizen at home, at school, and at church. <coughs> this is not to fetishize the text, for the object of reverence is not really the text. It is the popular sovereign, but often <laughs> The Constitution is a remnant of sovereign presence. The popular sovereign is the new God. It is the appearance of the absolute in history. Lincoln is speaking of an emerging constitutional culture. It's no longer the last judgment, but something like a first memory that is the ground force of law. It is the memory of the movement for the revolution of the Constitution. The Constitution is a trace of the popular sovereign who created itself in the free act of violation that was the revolution. History has become its own ground. Lincoln lived within a new political imaginary of law in which constitution displaces common law. Blackstone had offered time and memorial as a ground of common law. This was more than a little like the platonic myth of origin. But the American constitution was produced within the span of living. No one bears the scars of time and memorial. Lincoln's intuition is that between revolution and constitution stands the veteran, bearing the scars of his service. An American constitutional faith has emerged that models citizenship for the veteran. This is not because American constitutionalism will rely on the military virtues of classic republicans. Military virtue is useful to politics in the same way that good health is useful. useful. It may be necessary for successful politics. But it not, does not ground the force of law, even our military, after all, to rebel. Lincoln describes a constitutional culture that rests on semiotics of political faith in which one text displaces another. Critical to this idea of the veteran is the scar. Unlike the wound, which announces itself in the fact of pain, the scar must be read. War can cause injury just like disease, that is without sense or purpose. An army passing through is not so different from a plague passing through. The scar is an entirely different matter. The veteran's scar operates like a king's mark. It is a sign of sovereign's presence. Humanity suffers pain. Indeed, the contemporary human rights movement, I would argue, is founded on the complex experience of pain. It's founded on the wound, not on the scar. The scar distinguishes individuals and communities precisely because its meaning must be recovered through an act of reading. The scar is the wound become representation. It is a kind of text. Reading this text 
in place of wounding the narrative of national self-creation. The movement from wound to scar is that from the body of man to the body of the citizen. It is from the moral to the political. Politics begins, I argue, with the free act of violation. The sign of that violation is the scarred body. The scar is accordingly the representation of freedom. Even the scars of the defeated can be signs of freedom from loss, just as the scars of the tortured victim can become signs of freedom from regaining. The scars of the Revolutionary War veteran are read in a narrative of violation as a free act of political self determination. This move from act to text is exactly what is at stake in the move from revolution to constitution. Lincoln reads the veteran's scar as a representation of sacrifice. The scarred veteran bears the stigma of his fate in the popular sovereign. Having given himself up to the revolution, the veteran survives as a text to be read by all who witness the scar. The Christian symbolism is accusing the civil religion coming into its own in the mid-19th century is palpable. From wound to scar, from scar to text, from representation to identity. So in the 19th century, when people freely said we're a Christian nation, this is what Because the scar marks the body directly, it's a text that constant, constantly crosses the line between representation and identity. For the veteran, the scar brings to mind the circumstances of sacrifice. At that moment, the citizen was in the presence of an ultimate meaning that literally displaced every other meaning in his life. He existed then as the point of expression of the popular itself. The new absent has infused and destroyed. The American civil religion is complete only when the constitution of text steps into the place of the veteran's scarred body. Both are texts inscribed by the revolutionary action of the popular sovereign. The sovereign is so powerful. Of both texts, we can ask of what it is a representation. And for both, the answer is the popular sovereign. As the legal text displaces the veteran's body, we take possession of the text by reading it as a representation of our identity. Recalling the narrative, we become the object of that narrative. In this movement from representation to identity, we find a force of law. The constitutional text, then, is our common scar. We can give this idea a more precise meaning. For this text, I mean, we give it a more precise meaning. For this text, citizens will sacrifice themselves. Doing so, they express the truth of their own identity, which is to be a part of a popular sovereign. Thus, representation is linked to identity through an imagined sacrifice that is an act of scarring. It makes little difference whether the sacrifice is an act that we recall from the past or one that we imagine in the future. Because past and future merge in this act of reading. The Constitution is the product of our own free only so do we solve the problem of how successive generations can be free under an inherited constitution. This is the choice for law that is our constitution's culture. There's a direct line from young, the young Lincoln speaking at the local lyceum to President Lincoln speaking at Gettysburg. <clears throat> there, <clears throat> there we see very concretely what is at stake in the Lincoln representative text to identity through sacrifice. Lincoln now speaks of sacrifice as, quote, the new birth of freedom. Sacrifice refounds the nation by calling up the presence of the popular song. Once again, sacrifice produces the text. We are, he says, the nation, quote, dedicated to a proposition. Our constitutional culture arises out of this illusion of the text of the body and the text of the law. This is the Constitution of government that brings law and power as representation to become the end. Okay, now a few words in conclusion. Um, <clears throat> first, sorry. Like other forms of faith, the grand of constitutional culture is not justice, rather it's identity. The constitutional, the constitutional theory of justice comes early and it comes late in the project. Guides the framers' construction of text, and it has a role in interpretation. We can talk more about it in the presidency. But we're not bound to our law because it gets the theory right. Rather, we want the Constitution to be just 
because it was our own. Second, the fundamental structural relationship is that of representation to identity, not principle in its application. We must see through the text to identity. We must see through the constitution of the revolution. This seeing through is exactly the imaginative structure that links law to power and power to law. Bound to history, this project is deeply connected to the forms of violence because political meaning comes into the world through sacrifice. Whether we can have politics without a star is a deeply troubling and deeply difficult question. Not one I'm going to try and answer now. For now, it's enough to say that we cannot understand our constitutional culture without thinking through the relationship of sacrifice and to freedom. Third, we will make little progress in understanding American constitutional culture unless we place it within the twin strands of the genealogy of our modernity. This is both an Enlightenment project and a Judeo-Christian project. For this reason, constitutional theory needs to be supplemented by political theology. Constitutional theory will always find itself in the antithesis that separates the formalists from the realists. Scholars will theorize justice for measure interests. The constitutional culture, however, lives and dies in the imagination. It's the structure of meaning that it cannot be measured without being interpreted. Fourth, the American belief in popular sovereignty is not measured in elections or opinion plays. It is a belief grounded in the entire culture. It is true only as long as it continues to inform the imagination. This survived and scarred. It has survived from the scarred veteran, the memorials in Washington, full of rhetoric, popular films, and a Lincolnian reverence for law. I don't want to listen to that as well. These two are sites for the choice of law. Today, we have good reason to think that this culture may be retreating before other ways of imagining politics. One of the very striking characteristics of the last election was the absence of the language of sacrifice or rhetoric of the candidates. Finally, the approach to constitutionalism that I have pursued cannot offer a prescription for others any more than one religion can offer any suggestion for others. The constitutional culture is neither good nor bad. It is rather a way of, of being in a meaningful world. This approach can, however, lead us to ask of others, what gods occupy the space between law and power in your nation? And if there are no such gods, how do you manage for that? Thank you. Thanks so much Paul, for that great, great talk. We have time for some of the questions and comments. Uh, I see one already here. A very quick question along those lines. You're talking about scars, and I'm thinking about the invisible scars that go along with war that are appearing so frequent, frequently, especially as people are using drones and all of that, and uh, uh, the, the suicides, the PTSD, uh, all of that um, uh, non, uh, or, or difficult to visualize uh, aspect of sacrifice. And I'm wondering how that might affect how those sacrifices are employed in the logics that you're out there. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, and I think we've seen real change in the last 20 years on, on, on this issue. All right, so uh, uh, now, uh, you, you know, one, th one thing we've learned since the 60s, I think, is, is the cult of the veteran, right? It's politically unacceptable to criticize the veteran, right? You criticize the politics, but you cannot criticize the, the, the veteran. And why is that? Well, for the reasons I was trying to suggest. Uh, now, as we think about the veteran who suffered, right, uh, we, we've seen a m much more uh, openness to what we call the, the invisible scars. So a scarred veteran now automatically includes a person suffering from um, uh, 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 PTSD. Right? Uh, and, uh, and, and I would say, you know, this is all very, very, very general, but, but of course what we understand as sacrifice or, or injury, right, will change as our other uh, ideas of uh, uh, change. There's no stability. It's not, uh, you know, uh, in, in the sense that, um, you know, the Revolutionary War veteran showed the, the musket bullet, it has to look like that. It's the idea of the scar, uh, the idea of sacrifice uh, uh, that's important. Uh, and so we see it again today, uh, go into this, but 
But of course, this is, this is the way we understand the relationship between the terrorist and, and the citizen. Uh, you might be asked to bear this scar, bear the violence, uh, the political violence of the, of, of the terrorists. And, and again, what does that look like today? Well, it looks like everything from you know, being shot in their schools to 9 11 uh, to uh, it's, you know, understanding that um, you know, political identity makes me uh, uh, individually vulnerable. Uh, and so, and that's not something you know that I can withdraw and consult from. But just a quick follow-up: the, the suicide counts might actually be reinforcing uh, in, in, in those logics, and maybe we aren't dealing with those suicides in the way that we should because we've got that notion that this is the sacrifice they have made. These these wonderful veterans they have had in their life. Well, I think there is a there's a flip side that maybe you're suggesting to you too, but but I need to think about it some more in this context, uh, which is um, uh, it's a two-sided. Uh, it, there's the phenomena <coughs> of bearing the, the, the popular sovereign in and through the body, which is what I focused on. Uh, but then there's a long, dark history in the country of, uh, of a casting, or subordinating, casting aside those who we do not believe are capable of bearing the sovereign. Right? So that's the history of, you know, of, of the slave, the black, you know, and that's, that's very literally developed in Dred Scott. Why can they not be citizens? Because we can't read their sacrifice as sacrifices for the nation. Right? They're not capable of bearing uh, the popular sovereign. So, uh, so, so there, that's a, a, you know, so we can see that, in, 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 this is the way I understand the progressive uh, opening up of military service. Uh, to different groups, and it's always the, the last one you know, to be allowed into military service because because to be allowed to bear that uh, is the privilege of citizenship. Um, uh, so, uh, of course, that talking about groups, it doesn't take us to I think your question, which is, well, might we not be suspicious of individuals as, as well as uh, inadequate to bear that, uh, 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 so, so to speak? Uh, but, but, but again, I, don't, I want to emphasize the point I made at, at, at the very end. Uh, I, I think we see this all over. All over. You know, walk around this neighborhood, and you see the plaques of the firemen uh, on the walls of the firehouses. Um, and they are in, in, in this tradition, the, the men, the first responders on 9-11. Uh, but I can't tell you how strong this uh, uh, idea remains, or whether it's going to remain. I think it's, it's, it's still vigorous. But, but there are lots of people, lots of forms of American politics. One has to question whether, in fact, this tradition is uh, 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 so. I have an easier time understanding science and religion. And I have to go to have a bit of information that uh, on the other side of the encounter between the West and the West, uh, and the, the non West, science and religion was perceived as these two definitive signs of Western circularity, visionary, you know, and the Western technology, imperialism, colonialism. So, so the different era, the people in different parts of the world they sort of see this with very different emotional responses. And, and, and these two things are very much uh, brought together at the end of the 19th century in the American imperial exactly. project. It's both Christian and enlightened. Yes. And so in this context, uh, then, Point to this question of history. I agree with you, you Victor, and your paper to the constitutional culture is neither good or bad, it's just about meaning, it's being in the constitution. I like that one very much. However, meaning has it, is always itself shaped in some history and interpretation. I mean, it's going back to the, the more general, sort of a more almost literary critical context of your talk. In, in light of that, how would you uh, 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 think, think through this question of history as a history of meaning, history of interpretation, including various stages, moments of like pre understanding, prejudice, you know, pre understandings as kind of like that. American history in particular is rather short. Right? It's uh, born in within modernity. Uh, uh, frame. So right. how would you compare that to this very long array of meaning? For instance, the meaning of the constitutional identity 
you know, those kind of things. What if that was shaped in the in agricultural society, in feudalism, in sort of an ancient uh, classical culture? Uh, so how, how would you place America with this uh, understanding, right, uh, or meaning uh, in that sort of like true? A strong a historical context in a strong sense. Well, let me say three things about that. Um, I hope uh, that I uh, made clear that um, the, the American, what's called the American Constitutional slash Revolutionary Configuration, is a contingent product of the bubble in which it arrives. We were talking about uh, before about. When is the first constitution? I said, what is uh, and, and why is that? I said, well, because, because it has to be linked to revolution, <laughs> right? So when you when do you find this complex of revolution, which is this political science uh, ideal, which is sort of ideal? So I don't, I, don't, I think that the invention of revolution, talking about this earlier, the invention of popular revolution is deeply related to the invention of popular political science, the new political science. So. Revolution is just, isn't just any popular mobilization. Revolution is a theory. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so you raise a good question uh, 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 of cultural uh, practice that emerges in a, a particular political moment. How long can it survive? And I'd say a lot of the conversation over the last two days has been about that. Right? How much can this absorb? Right? Uh, it can't absorb, for example. Uh, what Mark was talking about earlier. Uh, if, if we become unclear about our borders, right, we can't absorb that. Right? It's not a project about globalism. Right? Uh, and, uh, and this is why I've read a lot about this. This is why American, American idea of, uh, of law, legality, of relationship, legality, and uh, sovereignty can't absorb international law. It has immense amount of difficulty. Uh, and most, most people think this is a kind of um, you know, conservative plot against the liberals who you know, are for international law. But actually, the model I'm talking about cannot deal with international law. Uh, uh, because uh, law is taken as an expression of the authorship of the popular sovereign. So when you start talking about international law, you're talking about a completely different understanding of law. So, so it's a real problem in America for, to understand where international law fits, even, even when we completely agree, agree with the substance of it. So you know, there's no big gap between human rights law and American civil rights law, but lawyers and judges just don't know what to do with it because it doesn't fit this model. Well, it doesn't mean they don't can't make uh, compromises and exceptions and try and do the best they can, but it doesn't <coughs> easily fit. And that's always a creative crisis for this. So, so one thing to say is, uh, don't know how much. Don't know. I don't think we're, we're at the limits yet. Um, but I do want to say, um, what I was talking about here is what I would call um, the structure of our um, a culture of political legitimacy. What is the relationship between these terms of popular sovereignty, of revolution, and constitution, uh, will it consent and uh, assault? Uh, I don't talk at all about what is the content of that. Uh, the only point which I came close to that was saying we're not attached to our law because of its content. And I, I used to use the analogy of your children. I said, well, you don't love your children because you're just, right? You want your children to be just because you love them. Uh, and, and we have that kind of relationship to the Constitution. As well, we don't we don't shop for constitutions and ask well which one is the most just, and then say that I'm moving there, <laughs> right? We we have ours, <laughs> and we try and interpret it in ways uh, that are consistent with our ideas about justice, and that powers tremendous change uh, uh, in the actual body of constitutional law in the last two hundred years. So you know, I have no patience at all. Well, the content of the law is somehow stable. That, that can't be right. So, so one way to think about your question is how much reform in the perspective of the just content of the law is compatible with the structural legitimacy of the law. When do those two things hold? Right? That's a really interesting question. Uh, 
uh, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, um, but, but that's where I, I would say, um, Better. And, and um, well, I'm still. Yeah. Uh, just case, I, I'm wondering about how far to take the trope of sacrifices here. Um, and, and I guess I'm wondering, on the one hand, I guess, okay, so I'm imagining that the, the sort of cleared law exercise I'm sorry, but might be solved as a way of going to another place and figuring out this kind of structures of sacrifice that are possible there and kind of trying to, to promote those structures of sacrifice and things like that, right? I'm interested to see what you think about that. But then the other thing that's sort of on the U.S. domestic level is that it sounds like you're indicating that the, the basic, the primary um, trope of identity is going to have to be sacrificed rather than some kind of idea of individual rights. And that therefore, if, if you see some kind of reason for hope in our present political situation, it would really be with those who um, kind of make a plea for sacrifice, which is to say mostly kind of the, I would say, if, if you find it, it's really like with the two party, right? With those people that say, um, you know, cut the Medicare even if it's bad for me, right? Because what I want is the freedom to, you know, uh, get sick and die, right? In, in a sense that, in the sense that, uh, you don't want uh, any kind of guarantee because that destroys the possibility of sacrificing freedom. You want to, you want to live in a situation of freedom in which you've got back precisely the, this this lack of the, of the safety net. Right, and so that there's, there's. I mean, I guess I'm wondering if, if what's your what's your take on that? Whether the, the culture of sacrifice is really in that, um, whatever, in that impulse toward destroying the state. So, let me be clear. I, I, I don't think that politics is about a definition. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, a definition. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so it can't be that. Right. Uh, uh, it's not about death wish, it's about that freedom, that, that ability to then make the sacrifices for others that would help them, rather than having that that possibly take, possibility taken away from you because the state is already there to, to, to be the safety. Right? I mean, well, I'm not so sure about your example of safety, safety net, but, but remember what I understand is sacrifice. Right. Um, uh, Reading of the self was a point of, of instantiation and manifestation of the popular self. So it's reading oneself in a political context in which you understand your, your individual interests, your finite interests, uh, are being displaced by something that has uh, ultimate value. Right? Now, um, and, and that I think is the, is the, you know, I wrote a book about popular film to, to say, but this is the theme uh, of American popular uh, of film. And, and so I, th I think that that idea is, is very strong and very uh, 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 prevalent. Uh, and, uh, but I'm, I'm still not quite sure I'm following, you know. So it's not about, it's not about, um, you know, moving this boat to uh, a guy on a street corner showing up and take over <laughs> anyone else. It could be, I suppose, under certain circumstances, it would be possible to read that act as an affirmation of the state. You know? uh, but it's the reading of the act as an affirmation of the state uh, uh, that, that is important uh, to me. And again, I don't think, I don't, it's not the act itself that's so important. It's the imagination. Imagine the possibility. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so if we think about terrorism today. So, a lot of times when I talk about uh, this, people say, "Well, well, you don't have conscription, uh, and, and so the state can't make a claim on, 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 on a life." On, on, on. Uh, and, and I was, I, I have two responses to that. Yes, I can. Uh, and it's, it's just a, 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 a congressional policy decision not to have uh, a conscription. The state has the authority uh, to conscript. Uh, but two, it misses the point, which is that um, uh, we live in an age today of 
where everybody is conscripted all the time. Uh, and that is in our imagination that there's been a breakdown of the distinction between the combatant and the non combatant. So the enemy today is the uh, terrorist who attacks you because of your political identity. And that's what's imagined uh, as um, uh, the possibility of sacrifice for, for the state. So I think we've, in some way, normalized uh, the practice of sacrifice as a, as a routine element of everyone's uh, daily life, which makes this whole model, I think, more powerful, not less powerful, under contemporary uh, uh, conditions. Unless you tell me, which may be true for some people, that that's the last decade. <laughs> and and we, don't, we don't think about that any, any, anymore because you know, we're, we're all just too busy cutting people's welfare back. <laughs> uh, so so I, I'm not sure I've fully answered you, but we've talked about it. But that argument about terrorism conscription is, is great. Right? I, time's March gone. I see two comments. Maybe we can take them both and then we can respond to them both together. Yeah, this is very interesting. It's, it's, it's a lot like the uh, crusading ideology, mythology uh, that I was talking about earlier, um, showing pictures by the way, right? Um, I get it in terms of uh, revolutionary scars, or maybe scars in the, in the march of pro constitutional progress. I don't get how the scars of, say, the Vietnam vet would be in the same category, or the scars of the, the Iran vet that you have to have. I mean, also, on the flip side of the suicide <clears throat> bomber, the revolutionary martyr on the other side is doing the same thing, um, you know, claiming sure, sacrifice. Sure, sure, yeah. Sure. But, um, so how, how does it, how, how can you... Well, I, I don't agree with the I mean, I do think the, the interesting thing about Vietnam, is, is um, the political process by which the, Vietnam, the, the, the veteran of the Vietnam War was elevated to the status. So if you go to the Vietnam Memorial, it's like one of the most moving sites in Washington. When I travel, I, I would go to veterans' cemeteries, you know, pay my respects to the veterans. Um, but they're often extremely moving uh, uh, sites. Uh, and so I, I think actually, um, I don't know if it's still true, but, but for a long period, let's say the, from the decade, the last decades of the 20th century, the Vietnam Memorial was uh, you know, the, the, the most popular, certainly among the most popular sites to visit and express your respects. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's, it's very interesting because you know everybody's individual name is, is put up there. So, you know, they have to be recognized for their sacrifice. Uh, uh, so uh, so I, I don't really agree. I think that we have it actually this, one of the one of the great political efforts of the last of the end of the twentieth uh, century was to put the Vietnam veteran in this tradition. Um, I think we're still struggling with Iraq. I, I, I don't know where we are. Iraq veterans. I don't know what the memorials. Iraq veterans. I don't know what the memorials. Iraq, 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 this is the problem. Yeah. Uh, but of course, we we have completely changed our discourse. Uh, I mean, I can remember back in the sixties when we yelled at the pig and blue tomatoes. It's just un, unheard of uh, now. So, uh, so I don't think I, I don't have a problem with Vietnam veteran in, in uh, 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 this camp. Uh, you know, there's an interesting. I had a student who, who was working on this point. What about those private contractors? Yeah, that's cool. Black 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 Black. Black. Yeah. yeah, you know, they're paid. They're mercenaries. Do they fit into this camp? Where are they? Because they're doing most of the work. And he did this in an anthropologist. And he did this great paper. I mean, she showed that uh, when they are killed or injured, right, their families make exactly the same claim that they must be recognized for the sacrifice that they made. They are now, you know, you go to the Blackwater office complex, and there's memorials, <laughs> right? Just like the veterans' memorials. Um, uh, so they make a powerful claim that they want to be respected. Uh, and seen and sacrificing uh, 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 for, for, for the state. You know, I, I don't know how many people buy that, but they certainly feel the same, the same uh, uh, pressure. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And just briefly, when I saw the wall, William E. Ruckel's house is in, yeah, on there, and six other administration aides are actually among the 59,000. 
Although it couldn't possibly be the generations of our you know, grandson or just the same name. It's a very strange phenomenon. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about um, the culture uh, of the, the countries around the world. I mean, we're one world policeman, and then there's 190 other countries. We can't possibly understand all those cultures, but they can all understand us to some degree. So don't we get manipulated by the peoples around the world to a large degree when, when the Project for a New American Century thinks, oh, we'll start a democracy in Iraq and it'll spread to the whole Middle East. Uh, they're falling into a, a trap, obviously, that uh, George Bush's father saw through. He wouldn't help the Shia uprising uh, in 91, because he knew that, that 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 would be another ally of Iran, <laughs> which right. it ended up being. It, right. it, 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 so we make so many mistakes, right. Right. and we make mistakes on the power side, on the destructive side. Uh, we tripled uh, right. uh, 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 terrorism incidents, you know, and so forth, quite right. of them. I mean, so, uh, so, because so question we don't we do, are we better using the carrot than the stick uh, for worldwide? Uh, so, so let, let me just make uh, two comments. Um, uh, we, we are led by incredibly stupid people who make, that, <laughs> who make all kinds of, uh, of, of, of mistakes in, in your sense, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, we would be better off with more carrots than sticks, but. Um, let me emphasize that as any cultural resource, this can be used, what I've tried to say, can be used to explain and criticize. Uh, so the worst thing that can happen to a political leader uh, is to send the boys, not the boys anymore, but to send the troops off to a cold war with which we do not identify as you know, uh, a, a part of the American political project of, of affirming uh, the existence of the popular self. That is the worst thing that can happen to a politician. Uh, and, and so we use the same form of discourse to say you know, George Bush is a murderer. Uh, George Bush is you know, the least successful president of the world. He had people killed for no reason, <laughs> right? Um, so this is not a set of justifications that are freely available for any uh, decision to sacrifice. Uh, individuals. It's just the opposite. If you can't persuade people that their sacrifice was justified, right? You got to contend with their mothers, uh, and you, you know you got you got to contend with their families and and their political communities. So so the stakes are as high as can be uh, under my understanding of forms of legitimacy uh, for political leadership. Um, and uh, and I'm I'm actually. Uh, Again, this goes to Americans can't understand international law very easily. Uh, they can't understand humanitarian intervention very easily either for the same reason. Because you know, if, you know Syrians want to kill Syrians, there's no there's, that's not yet a reason for an American mother to say I'm willing to sacrifice my son. Right? Why, why would I want my son to be killed because Syrians want to kill each other? Um, uh, so the, the the grounds of justification narrow the more seriously you take. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, this set of arguments. And, and, and of course, Bush's example. When it turned out Iraq was not threatening to the United States, that there were no weapons of mass destruction, uh, he was finished. Um, you know, exiled to wherever he is in painting pictures, he's just finished. Uh, he can, he can also, uh, there's no alternative explanation. You can't say, yes, but we did what was in Iraq. Um, <coughs> Even if it was an exclusive. Marsha. Yeah, hey, Marsha Pally, how are you? Um, thank you very much. I wanted to weigh in on the discussion of sacrifice, which I appreciated all your comments, but I think it's not only about the military. Um, we sacrifice when we pay taxes for the education of other people's children or for the environmental regulations in areas in which we don't live or for the um, FDA supervision of drugs or food we don't consume. Um, when we contribute to something which we used to call the common good, quaintly back, back in the day. Um, and I would, um, I would argue that uh, following your remarks, that societies are premised 
on a, a productive notion of sacrifice for the sake of the society, especially the reciprocal covenantal um, political theory you described, the Israelite political theory that you described, uh, but arguably all societies are premised on this. Otherwise, there is no society, there's no common good. And perhaps one of the difficulties um, that we're facing today is the undermining of this um, understanding of society and of willing to contribute to something like the common pool, the common good, and, and then society starts to uh, rend, rend and unravel. Sure. Okay, so I want to agree with the beginning of your, the end of your comments about Okay. Uh, so, uh, people, uh, I say this to me all the time, uh, but, um, taxation or, or contribution in other sorts of ways to the common good should be understood as continuous with this idea of sacrifice. And I want to resist that. Uh, I think what we want to pay and what we should pay are just taxes. Uh, I, I think our um, uh, a contribution to the common kind of good is measured by justice. Uh, and that should be our aspiration to have just uh, laws. Uh, I think that sacrifice is not a matter of justice, actually. So, so when I want to talk about sacrifice, I want to talk about the real thing um, and uh, not. Uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, adjust uh, uh, requirements. Uh, and, uh, and, and so when I, in, my, in my work, I tend to try and separate ideas of what I call legitimacy, uh, which are what I was talking about today, from ideas of justice. And of course, these things are coming to you. And of course, you know, it's not so clear when, when uh, I always say, when, when, when the, the, the state becomes extremely unjust, it's not so clear that legitimacy doesn't, shouldn't give way. It's like, you know, when, you, when your child becomes a mass murderer, who may actually say, enough, <laughs> you know, and, and disavow them. Uh, so, 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 so I, I, I do want to try and keep those separate, although the question about, you know, of course sacrifice doesn't mean you've got to go kill, I'm not thinking about that, I'm trying to use that as kind of metaphor for how do we think about our relationship to the state and what it is that we can ask of us. Uh, and, um, uh, because uh, sacrifice, if you think about it, is, is never just. Uh, it's, it's always, and, and there's a reason for that. It, because it's, it always has to be free of it. Uh, so you can't pass a law uh, that says um, someone, you know, X, Y, and Z are required to sacrifice themselves. Um, it has to be a free act. You can, you can conscript people uh, into a military, so you can expose them to risk. Uh, uh, but in the end, you know, there's no law of America. I think it's not possible to have a law that assigns people to, to kamikaze units. You know, I mean, it's, it's actually an interesting problem in military ethics. What happens when somebody you know somebody's going to get killed, right? Uh, and how do you deal with that? And so, and, and I think there's a reason for that. That sacrifice, in, in, for reasons I was trying to identify, has to be a free act. Sacrifice is a kind of, of freedom. So, trying to incorporate that idea of freedom into the into the foundation of the state is important. Whereas Whereas justice is, you know, you can demand justice of people. You should act justly. Uh, so I think our tax system should be based on justice. It shouldn't be asking anybody to sacrifice. It should be asking of them what it is that they owe the state. Uh, now, I do agree that with the last part, but that idea of what I'm calling justice is under tremendous stress today. Uh, and then, of course, we, we have people who don't want to pay their taxes and don't want to contribute and don't understand the common good. All of that, I could pull back. And that's, that's its own problem. It's a serious problem. So I know there are more questions, but it's late. I know there are interview and preservation. So let me ask you to thank Paul for this wonderful time. <laughs>